after a brief presentation about the book on the part of the three editors, that is myself, Rebe Garofalo, um, to my right, uh, but maybe not to your right, is um, is Andrew, who is one of our co-editors, and Aaron, who is a third co-editor. Um, we're going to give you a brief overview of, of what's in the book, but I want to start with introductions of the folks who are on the panel. Today we have with us about half of the contributing authors to the book. Um, and I would like to introduce them um, in the order in which their chapters appear in the book. Um, as it happens, my chapter comes first because um, I wrote the history chapter. And uh, my name is Rebe Garofalo. Um, I'm a member of the Honk Organizing Committee. I play in the second line band and my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, the next person up is Greg Moore, who wrote a chapter on the history. Um, if you all would limit yourself to your name, where you're from, bands you play in, and your pronouns, if you feel comfortable sharing. them. Greg, you're up. Hey, everyone. My name is Greg Moore, and I'm tuning in from the remote north coast of California. I wrangle a band here called Bandemonium. And I wrote another chapter of history. He did. Um, Sarah Politz. Thanks. Uh, my name is Sarah Politz. Uh, I'm originally from Worcester, Massachusetts. I continue to be involved with a band in Boston called the Maconda Project. Um, but my job is in Gainesville, Florida, where um, I, I teach at University of Florida in ethnomusicology. Um, and my research is on brass bands from Benin, West Africa. Thank you. Your uh, panel was fabulous, by the way. Thanks. Um, Andrew Snyder, one of our co-editors. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew. Um, I'm living in the Bay Area, but about to move to Lisbon, Portugal, um, doing an ethnomusicology postdoc there. Uh, and my um, research focused on brass bands in Brazil and the, the honk movement, which grew out of carnival there. Uh, and I also co-founded uh, Mission Delirium, which I wrote about in the book. Um, and my pronouns are he, him, him. Kevin Lippman. Hi, uh, you already know I'm Kevin. I go by he, him. Uh, I live in Cambridge. I've lived in Cambridge, Somerville most of my life. Um, I was a co-founder of the Honk Festival, a, a previous probably alumni member of Second Line, and I'm the executive director of the School of Honk. Great, thank you. Megan Elizabeth Kalman. Hey everybody, I'm Megan Kalman. I am... Um, live in Rhode Island. I teach at the School for Global Inclusion and Social Development at UMass Boston. I'm a sociologist, though I actually don't usually write about music. Um, and uh, I play with the Extraordinary Rendition Band, and I am beaming in today magically from Northern Maine. So. <laughs> um, Becky Liebman, up there in the Northwest. Yeah, hello, honkers and honk lovers. Becky Lieben from the Pacific Northwest, she, her pronouns. I play trombone in the Artesian Rumble Orchestra and the newly emergent Sticks and Bones. Uh, John Bell. Hi, I'm John Bell, he, him, um, for the Second Line Social Aid and Pleasure Society, brass band and in the Hawk Committee. And I'm also a, a puppeteer. Uh, Rosa Daniel Lang Levitsky. Hey, I'm Rosa. Either she or they is fine. Um, I'm from Porter Square, Cambridge, but calling from calling in from Brooklyn, where I live. Um, I'm with the Rude Mechanical Orchestra, um, co-founder of Tactical Spectacle, our dance flag performance squad. Mike Antares. Hi there, Mike Antares here from the Seattle area. I play cymbals and megaphone chaotic noise. I help organize Honkfest West, and I'm a veteran of both minor mishap and Honk Texas organizing. And I, my pronouns are he, him, his. Thanks. 
Great. Jennifer Whitney. Hi, my name's Jennifer Whitney. My pronouns are she and they. I live in New Orleans and I play periodically with Slow Danger and um, only during carnival season with the crew of Eris Band. I wrote about the Infernal Noise Brigade for the Honk Book, um, which I co-founded in 1999, so long ago. And I, I work totally outside of the academic realm. I'm a physician of uh, East Asian medicine doing acupuncture and herbal medicine. Wow, thank you. Uh, Iris Ariely. Hi, I'm Iris. Um, I'm from Tel Aviv, uh, Israel, Palestine, and I play in a band called Kasamba. And I wrote a chapter about uh, bands playing in high risk situations. And last but not least, our third co-editor, Erin Allen. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Erin. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and uh, I live in Columbus, Ohio. And I've played with a handful of bands, most often with uh, environmental encroachment, but also with Clamor and Lace Noise Brigade, um, Dead Music Ensemble, and the Black Sheep Ensemble. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you all. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, let me start by giving a, a brief overview of how this book came to be. I had, because, you know, my band was an activist band, I had been thinking a lot about writing about the activism angle, and I had been watching our band and other bands do workshops in the public schools on education, and that got me thinking and writing about pedagogy, and then I became really interested in the history of brass, um, and then I started thinking, there's a book here. Um, but uh, at that moment, I had already been retired for eight years. Um, I, I, like Megan, I teach, I taught at UMass Boston for 35 years, um, but I had been out of the game for about eight years. So I started looking for collaborators and lo and behold, I found all kinds of people who are doing PhDs on honk. Um, we have become a cottage industry. Um, and so there was an obvious pool of authors um, and uh, Aaron and Andrew came on board very early on and I thank the lucky stars, my lucky stars that they did. Um, the process had been, um, the process of working with Andrew and, and, and Aaron has been as smooth as it ever has been. And I've edited a number of books. This one was by far the easiest. Um, and then uh, I had a contact at Rutledge uh, who attended a workshop we did at an ethnomusicology conference, teaching people to, to play music with a single workshop. Um, and she was so impressed with that, that she started asking me, she started bugging me to write a book about honk. Um, so we went to Rutledge and secured the contract to write the book. Um, and so that whole process was pretty easy, but um, as Andrew and Aaron will point out, um, easiest is not always best. So there are, you know, any number of strengths in the book, um, the chief one of which being that we are all not just observers of honk, we are active participants in honk. And it's very seldom that you find an edited book where that is the case. Um, and there's also a limitation. There are also limitations that are built into this perspective. Um, I just wanna make two observations before I turn it over to Aaron and Andrew. Um, one is that one thing that we make clear in the book um, and that I've written about earlier is that we're quite aware that the honk festival did not invent the phenomenon that we are calling honk. Um, in many ways, we are simply recovering and updating traditions that have been going on for hundreds of years. Um, and so here we're using the term honk more as an organizing principle, more as a, a, a metaphor for the kinds of bands that you're seeing in this festival. Indeed, if anything, part of the agenda of this book is to decentralize the centrality of the United States in all of this and acknowledge the fact that this stuff has been going on everywhere in the world for years and years and years. Um, and hopefully, by doing so, we plan to broaden the scope of how we think about the progressive street band phenomenon in general. 
the second thing I want to say is that the book and the festival that we're all participating in this week uh, have really enjoyed a productive feedback, feedback loop. Um, so, for example, by including in the book uh, Maria Abe's uh, interview with Hinta Lamuta and Sarah Pollitz's chapter on, chapter on the Gangby, Gangby Brass Band in West Africa, um, we opened the door to, to having bands from places that we don't usually think of as part of where honk exists. Uh, bands from Africa and Japan are now participating. Indeed, this festival has showcased the bands from all seven continents, including Antarctica. Um, so in this way, honk, a street band renaissance of music and activism is, you know, can be considered as something as the, uh, the companion text to the Honk United Festival. Um, and with that, uh, let me turn it over to Aaron for some more specific comments on what the book is about. Um, okay, uh, thanks, Ruby. Uh, so yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about the book itself and some of what's in it. Um, and as we've all seen with um, Honk United this week, this thing that we call Honk, um, this network is really expanding and growing um, so much so that, I mean, even before this Honk United Festival, we wanted to title the book Honk, a street band renaissance of music and activism in part because we felt that the term renaissance um, captures the growth of the honk network, not just in a sense of discovery or rediscovery, but also as something that um, represents an outburst of creativity deserving of the term renaissance. Um, so a lot of the festivals and bands that are that are part of this honk network, as you know, many of you <laughs> probably already know who are listening, um, many of these bands share progressive values and try to support progressive causes. So inclusion, diversity, activism of various different forms and democratic leadership, um, participatory and fun music making. Um, these are all themes that repeat throughout the book. And because of the variety of perspectives on these themes, one thing we tried to do in the book was to capture some of the contradictions of honk and the debates about how um, honk bands can contribute to these goals as, as well as what some of their limitations are. So we think of the book more as a, a conversation. Um, we're trying to represent what the debates are, but we're um, not trying to take a dogmatic approach as to what the correct answers to any of these debates is. Um, so like Ruby said, all of the contributors to this book are involved in honk in some way as musicians or organizers, educators, volunteers. Um, so the book is a is more of a collaborative endeavor by, you know, actors within the honk movement to kind of critically and collectively reflect on our own movement, in a sense. Um, that said, uh, you know, as Ruby mentioned, we really don't think of honk as a unitary self-contained movement. Um, movement and intersects with other diverse movements throughout the world, which all remain in dialogue with one another. So after Honk United, um, we hope that will be even more true than it was when we wrote the book. Um, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about just sort of the different sections of the book. Angie, I don't know, could you throw up that table of contents at all? Ah, there it is. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. so. Uh, <clears throat> uh, where's my, oh, we're sharing screen. Okay, so cool. So we divided the section, um, the book into five sections that, that you can see here. Um, and in the first section, history and scope, we have a handful of chapters about um, honk festivals and or activist street bands um, in a variety of dif different geographic locations and socio-political contexts. So, you know, places like Brazil and Europe, Benin, um, Japan, and we did this to show some of the intersections between honk and other current or pre-existing musical traditions or movements. Um, and we try to get across again that honk isn't something that we think of as having started in Boston and then moving out from there, but as just one point of connection in a broader set of histories. Um, so the next section, um, repertoire, pedagogy, and performance, has chapters that discuss the complex dynamics of learning a diverse range of musical repertoires by a wide variety of communities, um, often with um, very different uneven skill levels. Um, and we also sort of include some of the issues that arise through various efforts at diversification 
by a community that's often identified as predominantly middle class and white. Um, so for example, these chapters deal with questions of cultural appropriation, uh, as well as things like accessible music pedagogy. In the next section, uh, inclusion and organization, um, we uh, both celebrate and complicate the ways that many honk bands organize themselves to be open and inclusive, uh, though many honk bands are still professional bands that limit their me membership. Um, the reflection in, in these chapters show that inclusion is far from um, a simple concept. And it's one that has to account for the needs of marginalized communities, the mission of a particular band or project, um, and individual expression. Um, the festival politics section of the book engages with uh, the question of what it means for a festival or a band to call itself activist. These chapters represent a debate about the relationship of honk to commercialism, activism, political engagement, um, and transformative change, ultimately. Um, and then the chapters in the last section of the book on the front lines of protest uh, discuss the efforts of many honk bands within the honk network to use the sounds and the power of brass and percussion ensemble to support and sustain social justice movements, um, often on the front lines of what can be pretty tense or even violent confrontations. Um, with those in power. So these chapters engage with the variety of ways that, that sound can be used tactically in the space of demonstrations as they, as they unfold. Um, so that's sort of an overview kind of of the, of the way we organize the book and what's in it. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew uh, for the next little bit here. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Aaron. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we, the editors, think of as some of the limitations of the book. I'd also be interested later in hearing uh, from the contributors what they think. Um, but first, we certainly do not see this book as any definitive account of the honk movement or movements. Uh, we view it as a contribution to what we see as some of the most prominent conversations, as well as an attempt to represent the increasing geographic diversity, which has just increased manifold uh, with the honk United Festival. But we see the, the book as having some big limitations in both respects. Um, our publisher gave us a strict word limit, which we still tried to exceed, uh, and we're very much at the limit, uh, and very much not in the spirit of honk. We couldn't accept all the chapters, uh, and we had to make difficult themes, uh, di difficult decisions around themes, geography, and case studies in an attempt not to be redundant that didn't have to do with quality at all. Um, we did start a companion website which you'll see many times in the session posted, if you want to, if you all want to post it now. Um, and uh, we, we were able to start a space there for some writing that we couldn't put in the book. There's actually three or four chapters uh, already posted there. And we still encourage submissions if anyone would like to write for the website. Um, so working with an academic press, Rutledge, uh, gave us a venue for publication, but it also had, uh, several limitations, right? Not least of which is the cost of the book, which is $50 for a paperback, we all already mentioned. Uh, we think that price is a bit exorbitant, even for an academic book. And there's a loss for the press and, and us in terms of sales and uh, distribution. So again, happy for you to get it in other ways. Uh, and we argued to, to try to bring down the price uh, to no avail but you can get the 20% the discount that we're going to constantly uh, mention in this kind of infomercial format um, uh, if you know, with, with the information in the chat. Um, so since the book was published through an academic press, we did we framed it in a way that would be seen as contributing to academic debate, or at least we hope. And this may not be the most interesting element for a lot of readers in the movement, uh, though for others it may be. But we aim to make it as accessible as possible for anyone who might be interested in the movement um, or questions of musical activism in general. Uh, we were still able to host a wide diversity of writing styles, which we were really happy with, from the very theoretical to the practical and the poetic. Um, and we were able to host a diversity of academic backgrounds. For us, it was more important that someone be a good writer and a movement participant than be on the tenure track. Um, and of course the non-academic press would uh, allow for even more forms of experimentation. 
Um, so lastly, in terms of geography, even though, as Ruby said, and Ruby and Aaron said, uh, we wanted to decenter the United States in thinking about honk, uh, and we were able to include chapters uh, from Brazil, Italy, Benin, Israel, Palestine, Japan, uh, there's still a ge geographic limitation of a North American bias. I think most of us are tuning in, not all, but most of us are tuning in from North America. Um, and we three co-editors are North American academics, uh, and we were working within our network. Uh, we decided to invite people who we knew um, rather than make a general worldwide call, which we thought would be kind of overwhelming. Um, but that had its drawbacks, certainly. We, there are things we probably would have discovered in doing that. Um, we, uh, m there are more chapters in the book that are about the US than anywhere else. Um, and this might give the sort of uh, sense that we think of the, the whole uh, movement as having kind of originated in the US and spread outwards or some kind of center periphery model. Um, and we really do try to, to complicate that in the book. Um, but uh, I think there's still that sort of, uh, the, you still might kind of perceive that that is how we uh, view it, just by the, uh, where the co-editors are from and where many of the contributors are from and many of the case studies. Um, so we think that, you know, we would be the, sorry. <laughs> um, we think that this US centric kind of uh, framing will be less and less relevant going forward. Uh, and we really encourage a, uh, any further work to be uh, more decentered uh, and even more transnational, both for co-editors and contributors. Um, and that said, we really encourage other efforts and uh, new projects, new work, new writing, uh, new ways of thinking about and documenting the honk movement or things that might be relevant to thinking about the honk movement, uh, which subjects that we'd like to talk about throughout this panel. So. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I think the next part of our panel, we're going to move into to hearing from um, from the rest of the panelists a little bit about each of their chapters. Um, so we'll again just kind of go in the order of of the chapters as they appear in the book. So our first question will appear to um, to Greg. <laughs> uh, so Greg has decades of experience playing in alternative brass bands with 30, um, 30 years in Europe. Um, which sort of form the experience for the foundation of his chapter. Uh, Greg, your chapter provides a history of, um, of activist brass band movements coming in post-World War II Europe. Uh, can you talk about some of the distinguishing features of some of the bands you talk about in your chapter and what they were concerned with? Um, sure, I, I can try. Um, I'm not sure there's so much that distinguishes them from um, bands and um, uh, honk bands, um, basically groups of amateurs. Um, a lot of them had um, somebody who knew perhaps more about music than the others that could sort of put notes in, a, in, in an order that would make sense. Um, of course, the, the political things that, um, that they would get involved in activism uh, would vary um, well, according to the times, of course. Uh, I th uh, one of the groups that I started out with was um, the the bands that would would accompany the uh, KDP, the um, the Rotor Front Rotor Front Kampfverbund. So this is um, uh, the Rotor Front was a paramilitary arm of the, the German Democratic Party. And of course, they would have been playing uh, a lot of Hans Eisler on these very, very strange horns, Shaw Mai uh, horns, which were actually um, tools uh, uh, in the, for in the German train uh, uh, operators and engineers, uh, signal horns. Um, then, um, I also traced, uh, th there was an interesting um, uh, organization, uh, actually a cabaret in East Germany called Karl's Enkel, which um, uh, 
destructed into uh, a brass band called the Bolshevitzer Kirkvel, and they were involved in protesting against the leftist government. They, they were protesting communists uh, and, and wanted a, a better communism, uh, less corrupt communism. <clears throat> um, a group formed in Rouen in France in what the mid seventies, when the um, municipal government closed down uh, the um, streets in the center of the city uh, and, and established walking areas. And uh, this group formed in order to animate those walking areas, make them more friendly. Um, during the 1980s uh, in, in Amsterdam, we were protesting um, uh, for, uh, in support of the cracking movement, the squatters movement, also against American cruise missiles. Um, earlier on in Holland, the, they were protesting against uh, cultural uh, conservatism and the fact that uh, the, the existing cultural organizations were not making room for new ideas. And this basically re resulted in um, an incredibly liberal and vibrant experimental art scene in Holland for 50 years, which is only now being torn, torn down. Um, other distinguishing features, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and the should should we move on to the next question? That's that's all. That's so interesting. <laughs> um, Me? Yeah. So uh, this and, chapter. Sorry, this chapter is for Sarah, uh, whose cha chapter is about the political expressions of Gombe Brass Band from Benin, based on ethnographic field work with the band. Um, so Sarah, in your chapter about uh, the about the band, you suggest that the activist politics of punk festivals, which are largely situated in the West, uh, might not be expressed similarly by bands coming from very different cultural and geographic contexts. Um, so could you say more about how Gondra expresses political stances and what we in the honk world uh, need to keep in mind in thinking about musical activism cross-culturally? Sure. Um... Thanks for the opportunity to share with you all, you know, panelists and uh, attendees. I think this became um, clear again in the panel this morning that we had with uh, Gangbe Brass Band and Aonle Brass Band and Onala Brass Band from Benin. Um, and it was even clear in, in sort of the differences with Elgon Youth Brass Band in Uganda um, how particular this is to the context in Benin and that it, it may reflect something of the context of African brass bands in general to a certain extent, but, but maybe not totally. Um, I don't think we could say that, that all African brass bands have this you know, same idea about um, their approach to activism or their, their non-approach to activism in whatever way. So I can speak to the Beninese context and to Gangbe. Um, and they reiterated this morning, these three Beninese bands that um, in a lot of cases, um, they have not felt like they have the space or the um, agency within Beninese politics to um, exercise, uh, you know, their activist potential. Um, that, that it's to the point where they, and Martial said it very well, he said he's never even considered performing or recording something against the government and being asked the question sort of made him think today, like, should he? What would that entail? What would be the consequences of that? Um, and, you know, he talked a little bit about, you know, the very real fear that um, they would lose the patronage of the government or they wouldn't be allowed to travel um, in various ways. So in my chapter, I talk about how a, a lot of the terms of activism that circulate around the honk festival like you know uniting against global capitalism or um you know just just all of the the vocabulary of of activism um is pretty different when you look at it from the context of benin where they had a socialist regime from 1972 to 1990 
And um, people are fairly ambivalent about whether that was successful or not. Some people actually prefer it to the current democratic government um, because the democratic government has gotten wrapped up in neoliberalism and structural adjustment and all of these things. And you know, quality of life has actually not changed that much. Um, so, you know, when you talk about capitalism or socialism, um, or, you know, the ability to protest publicly with music, uh, it's quite a different calculation for musicians in Benin. Um, and one of the panelists from Aonle actually brought this up really well this morning, that it's not to say that there's no, um, you know, latitude for people to express themselves. It's just that it happens covertly. And music is really good at uh, providing a medium for those kinds of expression, you know, often in local languages, in genres where uh, political critique is already sanctioned and it can take place through storytelling or through indirection or just the choice of a melody uh, can, can be uh, politically provocative in a way. Um, but you know, all of the, the bands from Benin this morning expressed it again, that this, this has to happen very strategically. Um, and even, you know, their travels and tours in France. Um, I have heard bands from Benin, you know, in French, when they introduce a song, talk about the slave trade or talk about anti-colonial um, kind of movements. Um, so that kind of discourse when they're traveling seems like there is, there is a space to have that kind of conversation. But to protest, um, you know, government dysfunction or corruption within a Beninese context, it seems like that is still uh, quite limited to these um, more kind of indirect strategies. Um, yeah, I think that sums it up. Ruby, can you unmute yourself? Kevin. This brings us to you. Kevin was a founder of the Honk Festival and then went on to be the founder of the School of Honk, which is the Honk Festival every day of the year. Um, Kevin, in the, in, the, in the chapter you wrote about um, the School of Honk, you refer to the school as an ethical spectacle. Um, tell us a bit about the alternative music pedagogies that you employ in the school and what you mean by that term. Sure. So I would say that honk is what I think of as ethical spectacle. And so the School of Honk is a place where we learn to make that ethical spectacle. And a little bit of history, I encountered this form of spectacle before I knew the term. Um, probably my first glimpse was sitting down with John Bell and Maury Martin and some others that are connected to this panel, trading notes on other uh, street bands we knew, like Root Mechanical Orchestra, What's Your Brigade, Brass Liberation Orchestra. And uh, I had also been talking about hearing from Hungry March band people about Spandata uh, in, in uh, Europe and the kind of festival they put on. And the glimpse uh, led me after John Bell had said, what if all these bands showed up in our town? I took that amazing idea and wrote this little two page, you know, manifesto about honk, kind of first coining this meme that was intentionally ambiguous and probably problematic, but certainly captured something that was going on with these bands, how they were transforming what are normally really staid and uninspiring political demonstrations into something that really left out and stuck with people and really attracted even potentially a new audience. Um, so we glimpsed that. Then I read this book. We're doing book shows. So I read this book called Dream um, by Stephen Ducombe, who was a NYE prof by day and an organizer with the Lower East Side Collective by night. And he, like many of us, had been really disenchanted with the fact that the left, by clinging to truth telling, had abandoned passion and narrative and storytelling to either Madison Avenue or the creeping Republican fascism that you know, begins with George W. Bush administration talking about an alternative reality and leads to where we are now. And he thought this was really unfortunate because there's just such a rich history that he tells part of the story of speaking to people's political passions through storytelling, myth-making, dream-making, especially in a country 
absolutely central conceit is making the American dream come true, the left is just losing out by not grabbing onto them. And so many of us saw a honk festival as a space where something was creeping in from the left that hadn't been seen in many respects uh, in a long time in America. A couple of other just brief examples to put in context. So um, I consider the Women's March with the pink pussy hats an example of exactly this, what's more precisely participatory, spontaneous, ethical spectacle. And so it's, so you imagine that everyone has a story about how they knit their own particular hat, but it's also related to a much larger expression when that day when there was this basically huge visual collective rejection of the Trump administration that still had an individual participatory element to it. That's like a non-musical version. The mu most, what I think of as the kind of pure musical version is the second line tradition gone full, but everyone picks up an instrument or starts dancing, that that's like one pure form of this spontaneous participatory ethical spectacle. The school of honk is imagined by me and the people that began it was an understanding that actually street demonstrations are not necessarily the most conducive space to learning how to make this kind of spectacle. And in fact, many aspects of being just in a self-organizing um, street band militate against the inclusion, the diversity, and a lot of other things, some of which came up, by the way, in the other panel that just preceded this, that I know Rosa was a part of, maybe others were. But we wanted to figure out how we curate a space that is truly, or as much as we can make it, conducive to diversity, inclusion, but that requires a certain amount of catering. It's not anything goes. It's not anyone just brings in a song and we all learn it. We think about what's the song? How do we arrange it so that people at different levels can, uh, you know, can be part of our group? And we also imagine um, how can we organize our school in such a way that we really will get everyone? This is something as simple as deciding we're not going to meet Friday at noon in the financial district. We're going to meet Sunday afternoon in a school and take over a neighborhood and invite people from the neighborhood to be part of the school. And I'll just close by saying, um, like everyone here, I think, knows it's not rocket science, but it also just doesn't just happen on its own. And part of School of Han's mission is to come up with basic uh, inspirations, uh, programs, uh, repertoire that can help people develop their own local circumstances to create that space for ethical spectacle. Um, great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so just we'll move right along here with the next uh, with the next panelist. So Megan, um, Megan's chapter discusses some of the tensions of organization and, and inclusion in honk bands. Um, Megan, in, in your chapter, you argue that honk does three things simultaneously. It reclaims physical space in cities. It organizes decision making processes based on participation and inclusion. And in doing those first two things, it redefines publics. Can you say more about how you see these processes as interrelated and how you deal with this in your chapter? Yeah, um, thanks. And thanks for having me. Um, so first of all, I guess I would say that's from the very beginning of the chapter. And I think that's what Honk does. I, I'm not sure that each band individually does that regularly. And that's like part of the tension. My, my chapter looks at decision making in Honk bands. And I... Um, and in this chapter are only bands who are open. So uh, leaderless or, or leaderful and bands that are not um, uh, delineated by tryouts or something like that. So obviously not all honk bands operate that way, but the ones that I'm studying do. Um, and uh, so, so, I mean, the, the premise of the question that Aaron asked, right? Like part of, part of what's happening in these leaderless bands is that groups are figuring out how to uh, make decisions in ways that are not defined by the sort of conventional hierarchies of our capitalist era. Uh, and that's the experiment. Um, and it doesn't always work. And sometimes it's wonderful. And sometimes it's disastrous. And for most bands, it's both of those things on a pretty regular and entwined basis. And so that's kind of the thing that I'm looking at, right? So I guess I would say the big takeaway uh, from that chapter is that 
leaderless bands always have leaders, right? They, they're often unnamed leaders um, or they're sort of passive leaders, but they always have leaders. And that, you know, aspirational though this idea of leaderlessness may be. Um, the other thing that came up is that groups with, with more robust um, infrastructure for talking about leadership and what needs to be done, et cetera, have like less passive aggressive blowouts, I guess I would say. So, so I mean, I'm an organizational sociologist, that's what I study. So I'm, I'm always interested in like how people are working out processes together. And so looking at how these groups self-govern um, in, in this, it's almost a utopian kind of thinking, right? About like how, how leadership could be reimagined in the context of like cities like this, um, cities like the one where Honk is, cities like the one that I live in. Uh, you know, so that, that was sort of the driving force of the chapter. Um, the, the reimagining piece, I think the way that, that those internal processes link with the external processes is that when nobody is the boss, right? When, um, when decisions get made fluidly and sometimes like sometimes they, it looks like a power struggle, but this is also like what happens in my band and in other bands, right? Some group wants to stand up on this like group of planters and play and those group wants to go into an alley. And like, so there is this sort of like embodied physical uh, collective democratic experience of playing in the streets um, that I think in some interesting ways mirrors what goes on in the bands themselves, not always and not as tightly as I've just cast it. Um, but the new publics piece, the last, the last piece of your question um, is that leaderless honk bands do, you know, as faulty as some of those inclusionary visions may be either in practice or even in theory, um, I think they do redefine publics by asking the group to reimagine what it's like to participate, right? And um, what it's like to lead and what it's like to think of, uh, think of a park as both a place where somebody lives and a place, a place where a band practices and like to sort of rethink who has rights to this space and like whose needs do we need to respect. And, um, and, and so these processes are sort of co-joined um, and they're co-joined co not in a uniform and not in a regular way. Uh, but they're in ways that that kind of they are emergent and they show up. I mean, a lot of the groups that I talked to um, would tell similar stories about like, what does it mean to practice in a public space when there's all these different people who have a claim to the public space? And, uh, you know, here's a group of uh, relatively privileged people with expensive instruments and they're making a big noise in a place where somebody else is trying to sleep like that kind of stuff. Right. So and this and this is the new public negotiation that um, that I think I'm gesturing to. Uh, so I can stop there, but I'm happy to say more later on. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. So this is a question for Becky, whose chapter uh, shows how one element of Honk's activism is the subversion of normalized notions of gender. Um, so Becky, in your chapter, you discuss how low brass instruments in particular are largely degendered from their predominantly male associations. Can you tell us more about how female and non-binary bands and musicians have worked to challenge traditional assumptions about who plays what in the Honk Network. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Andrew. And also before I begin, I just want to thank all of you other panelists, whether you know it or not, whether you know me or not, many of you have um, inspired me. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna broaden your question just slightly because it has been women and gender queer folk who have helped to broaden the stereotypes, but it's also been Honk itself. Um, and uh, I also want to say that the question of why is it that some people play, some genders play some instruments and other genders play others, did not occur to me, who grew up in a very robust era of, the, of feminism, second wave of feminism, question didn't occur to me until I was in my mid 60s. It's the air we breathe. And I will also say there's an analog right now as white people uh, re-examine white supremacy, the air we breathe, and to start asking some of these questions we haven't yet asked. Um, but music educators and anthropologists have been looking at why uh, instrumentation gets sorted out by genders. There's a lot written about it. It's just fascinating. Um, the music educators will say, well, kids get sorted out based on parental influence or peer influence, or sometimes it's just the needs of the band director. But nevertheless, these pernicious patterns have been set up. And anthropologists are asking about what underlies those patterns, which exist, by the way, around the whole world, uh, patterns of uh, 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 gender with respect to instruments. And uh, um, 
as anthropologists do, they, they immediately look at issues of power. Who gets to decide what is masculine or feminine? Um, who gets access to technology? Instruments being an extension of technology and thereby power. Um, so I got to interview so many fabulous people in the honk community. Um, I fell in love with every single interviewee. And uh, I can tell you three ways. Back to your question, Andrew. Um, one is it turns out that, that people who were born female who found their way to low brass instruments, my uh, interview showed that some of these folks, whether they knew it or not, were already pressing a little bit against gender stereotypes. People self-identified as tomboy or a little different. So, that, so the LGBTQ um, uh, uh, friendly aspect of honk culture perhaps is one contributing force about why you see so many women and gender queer folks on low breast. Um, another is uh, the informality of this world that that has been created. Um, uh, I have one very cool quote from somebody, let's see. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, she'd played euphonium in high school and thought if unless you were going to be a, a music major, there was no place for her. She said, when I saw Yes, ma'am, playing in a bar in Austin, I thought, wow, I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> so, so it's the accessibility. Also, um, the informality of performance allows that for people such as myself, um, who pick up a low brass instrument late in life, the, the expectations for performance are more invitational, shall we say. And then the last one, kind of like when Kevin said, this is not rocket science. I, I'm almost apologetic to say this in, a, in an academic setting, but it really came down to, or comes down quite a bit to, you can't be what you can't see. And for um, two, two quick quotes. One is uh, uh, Joanna who picked up sousaphone late in life. Uh, what the honk community has done is show you all things, all the things you can do, you know, because you don't walk around thinking, I'm going to play the sousaphone someday. Then you see all these women doing it and you get in love or you fall in love with it and you get inspired. Also, though, to your question, the emergence of all women gender queer bands has made a huge impact. And whether you talk to um, uh, 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 Liz Curry and Emily Smith from Filthy Femme Corps or um, Shauna Lynn Duffy, formerly of Boycott, or Jen Reel of Yes Ma'am, or Sarah Valentine of Pussy Grabs Back or Stevie Reed from Clamor and Lace, which I talked to all of them. They all spoke about the need to open up a space where people can feel, women and gender queer folks can feel um, they have a chance to, as, uh, as Jen Reel said, to, um, to create a space to work through <laughs> she said, I want to help showcase and encourage more genders in brass music. It's a very cis male dominated culture and in an inclusive community like Hawk, the imbalance has an effect. A few years earlier, I was playing tambourine in a band and although there were a lot of women in the band, most of them shied away from taking solos. I think a lot of that came from learned behaviors and gender biases. So the thought of starting the Yes Ma'ams was to collectively create a space through those things. It involves not only working on your own confidence, but lifting it up of your other bandmates. So many, many hands have been at work to make this um, degendering of instrumentation in the hunk world. Thank you. So Ruby, do you have a uh, question? Ready? I do have a question, my bad. This one's for John Bell. Um, John, your chapter provides some deep histories of um, some of the antecedents at Honk, many, many of which involve extra musical elements. Um, and my question is, talk about one of these that's closer to your heart. Give us, uh, give us your take on how radical puppetry has figured into the history of Honk and how its influence can be seen and heard in uh, um, in the festivals today. Th thanks, Reedy. It's, such a, <laughs> it's an honor to be here with this group. And um, I like the way that the, uh, it seems to me we're thinking about Honk as this 
ongoing process rather than something that's de set and defined. But um, I'm thinking of puppetry. I think of puppetry's connections with street performance and street music and political activism of, for example, uh, in carnival and pre-Christian trad ritual traditions in Europe uh, since medieval times and before. And carnival has sort of embedded in it sort of a radical uh, approach. And over the past week, you could see the consistency of these traditions with, uh, of giant puppets and brass bands with Cimarrona La Favorita in Costa Rica and Calango Careta in Brasilia, uh, the use of masks by Rimbamboom in Chile, um, and similar spectacle in, in the Brazilian uh, honk bands and, and festivals. And in, in terms of our own US honk history, uh, thinking of something Trudy Cohen noted in one of the honk story segments, um, Bread and Puppet Theater, which she and I come with, came from uh, near its beginnings in the early 60s, started connecting its radical puppetry its use of giant puppets and alternative spaces, um, which was rampant in, in the New York City happenings movements and activist circles. I'm thinking of people like the women who started Judson Dance, which was a place where Bread and Puppet worked, or the jam sessions they'd have in the loft at Judson with people like Steve Reich and Lamont Young, but also many other people, and also activists like uh, Grace Paley, who was a very early strong influence and was an anti-war activist and a local um, uh, community activist. Um, also, Bread and Puppet very early incorporated brass music, especially with roots in New Orleans music and folk music and experimental jazz um, in activist contexts like rent strikes in um, Lower East Saida, which is the Puerto Rican neighborhoods in the Lower East Side of New York and um, uh, Upper Manhattan, and then anti-war parades in, in, on Fifth Avenue, which um, Grace Paley and the War Resisters League had, had invited them to do. And I think over the years, there have been these specific connections that Trudy outlined, like between Bread and Puppet and uh, Kelly Seed and Feed Theater, which gave birth to the Seed and Feed Marching Band, or the Heart of the Beast Theater in Minneapolis, which gave birth to um, uh, the Brass Messengers, or Red Moon Theater in Chicago, out of which uh, the band Muka Pazza came. Um, also, and I think of Sarah Blust mentioning um, the, in terms of the birth of RMO, the uh, bread and puppet influence. So I think like the strongest connection in a way is, is the, going back to the 60s and um, Peter Schumann, who's the director of that company, um, this idea that politics and activism uh, or politics and art or activism and art are like, okay, uh, to combine an idea that's still controversial, thinking of shut up and dribble, which people say to athletes now, or shut up and act, which people say to um, actors right now. Um, I think that's the strongest idea in a way that comes out of, of, of Bread and Puppet's connection to, to these different aspects of, of activist art making, and including music. Sorry, I was talking fast. That's okay. Uh, thank you, John. Um, so we'll move right along here. Uh, so our next question is for Rosa. Uh, Rosa's chapter was written with Michelle Hardesty, who isn't able to be here today. Um, and the chapter focuses critically on the meanings of activism at the Boston Honk Festival, or the Somerville Honk Festival, rather. Um, Rosa, you argue that Honk's framing of activism at the Boston Honk um, has often been what you call anti-political. Um, can you explain this term a little bit? Tell us more about how you see it applying to the Honk Festival um, and give us a sense of how the festival might change in response to your critique. Sure, thanks. Um, so, <clears throat> so I should say my piece and to give credit to Michelle, it, it couldn't have been written without um, without her collaboration and also the like long long standing conversations that I've had with her and a lot of other um, a lot of other musicians um, so the piece is a polemic um, to be clear um, and it's pretty blunt and I'm going to be blunt 
mostly because this is a festival that I love that's been made by people that I love. So the, the main point of the piece is to get us out of talking in terms of activism, which is pretty much an empty term, and into talking in, in terms that are actually concrete. Um, so I was gonna just read from the, the piece to define anti-politics. And then I realized that, um, that there's actually a much more beautiful description um, in a Frederick Douglass speech that I was reading recently. So anti-politics is those who profess, is those who want crops without plowing up the ground, who want rain without thunder and lightning, want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. It's the fantasy of creating change without conflict or confrontation. It's the way that liberals and progressives can feel righteous without taking the risk of visibly choosing a side. Um, and it serves very particular purposes when it comes to cultural work um, that are a pretty serious problem. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I really appreciated in John's chapter is that he points out the ways that brass bands have been used in, in the past century in the US to reclaim public space for the Klan and for fascists, as well as for progressive movements which means that we need to be asking participatory culture, participation by who, doing what, and why, if we're talking about reclaiming public space, by who, for what, and why. Um, so the kinds of things that I think of anti-political in the context of, of Honk are things like naming the Somerville Festival as an activist space, but then not defining why, for who, to do what, in a way that would make it clear that a Proud Boys chapter isn't welcome in the, in the Sunday parade. Um, now, for the, over, in the past two years, there is a bit of an articulation that would make that harder to happen, but that took a dozen years. Um, another example is being incredibly supportive and very welcoming in concrete ways to justice movement oriented initiatives that various bands have brought into the festival and doing things like making it possible for the um, noise demonstration outside the ice jail in downtown Boston to grow from the 30 people who we could throw into the bread and puppet school bus to 200 people, an incredible wall of sound. Um, that was made possible by the Honk Committee throwing resources behind that. But that's an event that is not in the public facing publicity. It's if you show up for the Honk Festival and look at the program, you don't see the Honk Day of Action demos with labor unions and community groups and anti-gentrification groups. You don't see the noise demo at ICE. It's not taking the risk of visibly choosing a side. And the main thing as I see it that the festival and the Honk Committee can do to change that is to make active choices. There's no shame in not being a political festival, but if you're gonna be, then do it. Um, then be active, acknowledge that that means confrontation, that that means conflict, and know what, know what the goals are, articulate the goals so that you can judge what your actions are and how they stand in relation to it. It's a train that you're driving. Don't be passengers. Which is the anti-political gesture is saying, we have to be 
infinitely open. And even when that means that the presence of some groups, that some decisions mean that it's not a place that is safe or workable for some people to be. So thank you uh, for that powerful statement. Um, and keeping in mind that critique, and uh, if we have time, we can sort of think about it more broadly. Uh, in the context of thinking about the book as a framing of very general notions of activism and the kind of di diverse, uh, the diverse ways that that term is thought of uh, to, to take one that might seem kind of within this context, uh, anti-political. Uh, I wanna to turn to Mike, whose chapter is about um, kind of hospitality activism uh, and um, building on uh, Mike's experience of organizing hosts and guest musicians. Uh, the chapter examines the free homestays and the marginalized participating in the festivals as, as a form of activism. So, uh, Mike, can you tell us why we might think about hospitality as a kind of activism and how this practice uh, figures into the, um, the festival's meaning and thinking about activism? Sure, happy to. And thank you, Andrew, for the question. Thanks again to you and Aaron and Rebe for this opportunity and to uh, all my fellow panelists, it is great to be in this esteemed company as well to the authors who couldn't make it today. Um, so thank you very much. And and really what are we doing all today? We're participating, right? And participation is indeed a form of activism, a form of choice. So with that frame, I definitely wanna talk a little bit about my personal experiences and, and what the frame of activism I'm kind of talking about here. I wanna point out uh, a limitation is that much of my work was filtered through a, a North American bias, a personal experience bias, um, and while my research extended beyond this hemisphere. Uh, much of the direct information I received was uh, kind of fell under that same bias. Uh, but the the things that I want to talk about with um, hospitality activism are really uh, kind of a couple of key areas, and that's decommodification. It is um, direct participation, uh, and it is building trust networks. And so, if we go from the macro of the Haunt Festival movement, wherein uh, organizers in a host city are reaching out and welcoming the musician participants in, uh, and they're providing kind of the, the essential networks of uh, food and shelter in those um, public, you know, in the sense of both public space and in the sense of um, hospitable accommodations. Uh, that, that I think really kind of starts things off. And it's, you know, all of that is in the term of hospitality or in the sense of hospitality, uh, a gift freely given, right? It's paid without recompense, uh, without any notion of recompense. Um, and so all of these musician participants and activist participants are able to um, create this participatory festival and experience. And so uh, when I talk about the kind of decommodification aspect of that, really what I'm saying is, you know, we live in a time where, um, although, you know, maybe not as much recently because of the pandemic, but certainly before that, um, uh, no, the the notion of the gig economy uh, and and kind of you know you deserve to be paid for putting somebody in your home uh, was a pervading sense. Well, the haunt festivals kind of break through that and they go back to the roots of um, of, of hospitality, which is to uh, it's the, it's the sense it's opening the door to the stranger, right? The the other kind of pervading sense recently is this built built in distrust of stranger about this person or this group you know we can't welcome them in because of this or that reason and so hospitality activism is is just challenging yourself to open your door and your heart to the stranger to start those communications uh that you know may make you uncomfortable to welcome people into your home that may kind of push your buttons or push your boundaries but they're going to also enrich your life you know that that just widening of perspective and building your trust network and increasing your trust network, that's a key aspect of what exposes you to different views of the world and different ways of understanding. And um, that simple act of opening the door, you know, you may think it's a, it's a, uh, to one person or a handful of people, it may end, you may end up with 20 musicians sleeping shoulder to shoulder on your floor, but it is going to just open 
the the heart in in ways that I think are just vital for us moving forward in that participatory um, sense. Yeah. Gotta unmute myself. Um, I just noticed that uh, I don't see questions in the Q&A. So a word to everybody who's out there is listening. If you have any questions for the panelists um, or any of us up here, please feel free to submit them in the uh, Q&A uh, function in the Zoom, in the, uh, Zoom panel. Um, in any case, my question is for Jennifer Whitney. Um, Jennifer, you are a founding member of the, one of the most important activist street bands, the Infernal Noise Brigade. Um, the subject of your chapter. Um, you discussed the uh, founding of the, of, the, of the band and its first performance in 1999 at the World Trade Center debacle. Um, Not the World Trade Center. That was a different debacle. <laughs> <laughs> the World Trade Organization. <laughs> we were not involved with the World Trade Center. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you were not. <laughs> and for all you listeners out there, Please take note of that correction. Um, <laughs> please explain what was unique about the man, a band's musical activism. <laughs> uh, I am just so grateful that um, that y'all reached out to me when starting to put this book together. Um, it's just been really inspiring to to read what is happening in the world that I knew nothing about, and just to see how this. Um, how y'all have really cultivated and fomented this, this movement of activist bands. Um, and yeah, it was really fun to get to do a little um, hospitality activism when you three editors came down here and, and then when Mission Delirium was in New Orleans. So um, yeah, I'm honored to be here. Um, I, um, I really appreciated what Kevin mentioned about the, um, you know, the soundscape of protests, you know, back in, in, the 90s when I was living in Seattle, um, you know, for in Seattle, at least it was just, you know, a lot of banging on plastic buckets, a lot of kind of monotonous, um, listless chanting and, and just really no, no music, not, not where we were anyway. Um, and so when we found out that the WTO was coming, we really wanted to disrupt that, um, that like protest, um, slump uh, as well as disrupt the, the ministerial meeting of the World Trade Organization. Um, and we had worked, as many of us had worked together in a very percussion heavy band um, before that um, it was called Chikung. And we did a whole lot of ritual, uh, really disrupting the audience and the band kind of binary, did lots of theater, brought crowds out into the street afterwards to like, dance around bonfires and climb on giant metal sculptures and just have this wild time. And, and we just got away with a lot. And so we were feeling pretty audacious um, with that experience to, to go in and, and do, um, you know, support the disruption that the Direct Action Network was, was planning and organizing. Um, and I worked with, with them as well to, to plan the protest as well as with the, the INB. Um, so yeah, we were really just seeking to, um, to subvert everything, <laughs> to, to disrupt that dominant paradigm of, um, you know, and, and maybe lefty protests at that time, um, maybe they were so, uh, lackadaisical because of the weather in Seattle. I, I, I don't know, but, um, we just wanted to shift that and, um, we ended up writing some pretty bombastic propaganda and then trying to live up to it, um, and one of the ways we did that was, um, you know, well, one of the things that we wrote was um, that we wanted to be calculated, be calculatedly unpredictable and undermine the spectacle by introducing music of a disorienting or ecstatic nature into the sterile political discourse. And so some of that we sought to achieve by, um, by using a lot of um, odd time signatures, a lot of syncopation. We played only original songs and just drew from trance and ecstatic and carnival traditions from around the world. And, and, um, and then also had a lot of like amplified pre-recorded noises that we would 
would play um, and, you know, air raid sirens and farm animals and gongs and all kinds of, um, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, what, what ended up, um, what ended up happening was we just found that that our well first we found that we needed to write some more dance music <laughs> um and that was pretty humbling because so many of our songs were a little um a little too disruptive <laughs> for people to just get down to um and we also just were able to um like learn from the crowd and learn from the songs like we didn't write songs that we intended to escalate things or to de-escalate things but we did, um, we did plan from the very beginning, to, you know, we wanted to just support the will of the crowd. Um, we wanted to inspire them to do what they were already planning to do. And so we knew some people were gonna be locked down in the rain and the cold for 12 hours to blockade the, um, the entrances to the building where the opening ceremonies were supposed to take place. And we knew other people were probably going to be smashing up Nike town and, and then that there were going to be all kinds of other creative actions in between those kind of extremes. Um, and so we were, you know, just always reading the crowd and um, consciously and, and then picking songs that seemed like they would be in alignment with what, um, you know, with what we thought the crowd seemed like they were about to do. It was very much, um, kind of prefigurative song selecting in a way, um, but ca always careful not to uh, impose our ideas on that. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, um, that emerged that was, you know, over our um, six years of playing at a lot of big international summit protests, um, around the world as well as a lot of local and west coast smaller things um there, there was one song in particular that it just turned out that when we played that song people would tear down fences no matter what i mean we we chose it carefully because it it just had this effect and um it it, it was a um a moroccan rhythm from the foothills of the reef mountains and um and it, it was like the ritual that um, a couple of us had, had been there for these rituals. And it was this very frenetic ceremony that they did. It was a, a you know, pre-Islamic Lupercalia festival. And, um, and so, yeah, it was very surprising to us that that was the impact of that song. And um, so, yeah, I mean, really, I, I could say a lot more, um, but, I, I guess just, you know, it, it just was, it was really fun to witness all of the glorious things that people were, um, were doing to, to live out their politics in the streets, in this, in this public space reclamation, um, defiance and, um, and joy. And I just also really appreciated and, um, how we were able to, you know, live up to our name and be like infernally noisy and like super militant looking a lot of the time and, um, you know, marching in step and, and um, being a little scary and um, nerve wracking to people in power, especially. But at the same time, like that there was just this undercurrent of this ritual magic that we didn't actually consciously set out to do, but it seemed like that's what our, our music ended up facilitating. That's so interesting. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to move on to um, Iris for, our, for the last question of those of you on the panel, and then we will move into a, sort of a broader um, discussion, hopefully. Um, okay, so Iris uh, <clears throat> wrote a chapter um, uh, for, the, for the last section of the book. Um, She's an activist, artist, and teacher in Israel, Palestine, who's played snare drum with the activist street band Kasamba since 2009 um, and led a fantastic workshop earlier um, with some of those experiences. 
Your, your chapter discusses your band's participation in protests against the Israeli occupation of Palestine, where you often faced extreme violence. Um, given this year's rise in violence against protesters in the US as well as uh, globally, can you share the process your band went through to better handle high risk situations? Um, yeah, well, thank you. And uh, actually, I have to say it's really cool to go last because I got to hear all of you and see all of you and put the faces and the kind of the wording uh, together with your words in the book. So it's a really cool experience. Um, so yeah, I've been playing with Kasamba for a long time. And um, when I first joined, most of the actions where we played were actions against occupation, against the, the wall that was newly built at the time. Um, and uh, in different places in Israel and in the Palestinian territories. And in the beginning, I think also, you know, I was younger and I feel like there was this feeling like we were invincible. You know, we, we, we would go out and we would, you know, we, we would go from one action to the next. And it was this very powerful feeling like we are actually doing something um, against this very big and very, um, depressing reality that we are born into, you know, the reality of the military occupation. Um, but with this feeling of power that, uh, that is very important, um, there is a flip side. And the flip side is that the more actions like this that we went to, the more it took a toll on, on us emotionally. And, um, and it took for me a while, it took me a while to realize uh, what was happening and um, started to Kind of figure out that you know I'm not I'm not doing so well emotionally and I'm 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 noticing that you know I'm really triggered by things and I'm having a hard time sleeping and I have more anxiety and when we are getting ready to go to a to an action all of a sudden you know I have really mixed feelings so it took me a while to figure out what this is because nobody in the activist scene at the time was really talking about um, post-traumatic stress or any of these kind of terms. Uh, they were very foreign, very medical. Um, so that kind of led me to start reading about it and, um, and to start talking about it with my bandmates. And at the time, a lot of the bandmates were actually changing. People had left and new people had come in. And that was actually quite a big sign for us to realize that something's wrong because when a lot of people leave and this is happening over time, it means something about the sustainability of what we are doing. And as activists and specifically as activists in a place like this, it's really important for us to figure out how can we be sustainable? You know, doing something artistic is one way to be more sustainable, right? We're not, we're not doing the same old thing. Um, but uh, we had to start talking about it in the band. What is the effects of this, this trauma that we are consciously, actively going into every week? And, uh, and also to deal with the guilt around it because we are on the occupier side of the map. You know, I was born into the Israeli Jewish side. So who am I to say, oh, I'm not going to go to the protest this week, you know, while the Palestinians have to deal with this reality all the time. So there was a lot of stuff to handle uh, for us as individuals and also for us as a band. And we had started to try to figure out what we can do different. And what we can do different, it uh, ended up being quite a big list of things. And there are a lot of tools for bands uh, to use when we are going to face high risk situations. And like you said, a lot of people around the world and in the US and other places um, are seeing much more extreme police violence in uh, demonstrations and in actions. And we are, we are kind of going to protests and some of us are not quite sure what's going to happen and we have some anxiety, but we don't quite have the words to talk about it. And there's the whole thing about being courageous and, you know, and, and all the guilt about, uh, you know, your privilege and this whole thing. So for me, um, Part of what helped me to do it was was just research. You know, I, I went and I started talking to my friends about it, and um, and not just the bandmates, all kinds of activists, and um, and we slowly developed a way to to get better, and this was a process that took a long time, and part of the process was uh, just acknowledging how we're doing, 
how we're doing emotionally, how we're doing physically, whether, you know, this person wants to take a break and that's okay and they won't show up for the next rehearsal or for the next performance or not performance, but for the next action or whatever we play at. So for us as a band, it had to uh, force us to be very flexible. Okay, now we don't have this in instrument section. Nobody from that section is, is gonna be at the next protest. What are we gonna do? We have to learn each other's parts. We have to use each other's instruments. We have to come up with grooves and breaks and things that are more flexible. Um, we have to communicate better. And uh, we have um, all these different hand signs that we use for communicating when we're at an action, when it's very, very loud. And it's very hard to kind of communicate. Um, and my band, Kasamba, is actually part of a network uh, of drum lines that are protest drum lines. It's called Rhythms of Resistance. And the whole network, wherever there are these type of drum lines, we all use the same hand signs. So we had to kind of figure it out through the years. And, um, and I had come to the US um, to study at some point, and I, I had met up with all of you guys at Honk and, and started to talk about this stuff with other bands and kept in touch. And um, and then through the years since then and the increasing police violence, it's actually been a useful thing that I can kind of spread forward. You know, I can, I can tell more people uh, about what we learned and I can learn from more people. Um, you know, we had a, a, um, a workshop earlier today where Jennifer you know, came on and she said, oh, you know, this is something that we did with my band. And, it, you know, and I said, oh, that's that's a new trick. You know, I've been doing this for so many years and here's a new tip that I can use. Um, so this exchange is really meaningful to me. And I'm really happy that the book gave me and us a chance to do this exchange, you know, to be uh, in touch and, and share this information so that we can keep doing what we're what we're doing, what we love to do and what we feel is necessary to do. Um, and this is a very short time to speak. And I do think that um, there are resources out there for bands and for activists in general. So I'm going to put a couple of them in the comments, things that have to do with protest safety, things that have to do with uh, post-traumatic stress for activists, with understanding what that is and how it's influencing what we are doing and how can we be sustainable and do what we're doing you know, years from now. Um, so I'm, I'm going to click on that and leave you with um, these, these resources um, in the comments. All right, well, thank you, everyone, uh, for, for telling us more about your chapter and also the broader experience that went into it. Um, it's been really interesting. We, uh, we sort of planned a longer uh, um, panel discussion, but uh, we are very close to out of time. Uh, we will be ending the streaming at 3 Eastern, um, no matter what. Uh, but uh, if you if you want, we, if we trail a little bit in, if you if the attendees, if you want to sign into Zoom, then you'll be able to, to finish there. But we will be uh, um, ending very soon. I wanted to just ask you all one question, um, uh, which is about COVID and about this whole experience. Um, and if you all want to give like, uh, just a few thoughts on, um, and uh, I'm, I'd be curious. Um, so Hans puts a premium on the physical taking of space and, and social intimacy of participatory performance, but obviously COVID-19 changed all that. Um, and while it certainly inhibited us, it's also created new opportunities for music making and sharing that we never had before imagined, such as Hans United. So if you've been able to attend, uh, be interested in what you experience with this idea of an online festival, but more broadly, even if you haven't, uh, what new opportunities do you see arising in the pandemic? And just to say, this is something that we didn't, you know, the book came out right before the pandemic and we never thought about the reality that we're in now. Um, so I think it's gonna be something that we're all gonna be thinking about moving forward. Kevin. I'm just put in that whatever else this is a time to have conversations like these and to see people like you any way we can and to connect and think about on the other side, whatever that other side is, how can we make it more effective, more inclusive, 
and think about that now when we can't be out with that physical space, but having the tough conversations so that when we come back out, we can convince everyone else that this is what they should be doing too. Because I think part of the message I hear over and over again is we've made some progress, but the movement could be much, much bigger if we found the creative ways and had the tough conversations and asked the difficult questions to make it even bigger and more powerful when we're on the other side. Anybody want to make a final comment? I guess I'll jump in there. I, I, um, you know, we've in my band, we've had a lot of conversations about like, what does this moment mean? And what can, what can we do from it? Uh, learn from it? How can we make something just as good? I actually don't think I don't find a lot of value in saying we're going to make something just as good. It's just going to be online. It's not just as good. It's, it's different. And there is value in um, taking, I think, as Kevin was alluding to, there's a forced pause here. I think we can take it, you know, use the forced pause well and thoughtfully. Um, but I also think to me, it has highlighted how much I miss playing music, um, not, not just studying or writing, but like, I think it's okay. Like, I think the grief has taught me, the grief of missing has taught me certainly as much as any like studious reflection about either my band or the community or whatever. Like, and, uh, and so I think that that time is good. I would say I've learned 